All right, so next up, we have Vis with Hot or Not, The Hacker Way. Please give him a warm welcome. Yay. <laughs> so this is what people in sombreros look like on thermal. <laughs> it's good times. This is you. <laughs> so yeah, it's a cool toy. Um, OK, gimmicky. All right. Um, does this work correctly? Yes, it does. All right. So yeah, hot or not the hacker way. Um, one nerd and a floor gun. So I basically had an epiphany uh, a little while ago when I was doing other things, um, including this, um, that InfoSec is basically like Monkey Island. It's like one of those uh, LucasArts um, point-and-click adventure games. And the intention of InfoSec to like get stuff, to make things happen, and to make stuff go, you basically just rub everything against everything else until you get what you want. And it, like, that, that actually works pretty legitimately. It defines fuzzing, essentially. So basically, this, the Monkey Island talk, right? So I'm Vis. I'm a co-founder of a little, little tiny three-person company called Carbon Dynamics. Uh, in former life, I was a sysadmin. Um, I've done some stuff. You're not here to hear about me. You're here to hear about the toy. So um, who didn't think this was cool as a kid, right? Like, also, pro tip, um, the <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the success or failure of your talk depends entirely on the quality of the animated GIFs that you have. So they're... <laughs> get out. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, who didn't think this was cool, right? The only trouble is that it's like ridiculously, ridiculously, prohibitively expensive. Like the really, really fancy Flourish stuff is $100,000. Like who has that kind of money? And the camera below it is the, the business slash prosumer version, which is like 32 grand. Like that's, that's a car. I, I, Unless, unless you're a wealthy person, like, you basically can't play with Fleur, right? So back in 2010, I asked Fleur, hey, I'm a, a security researcher in San Diego. Um, I would like to do a research project where I take a Fleur gun and I pointed at some stuff, like the hacker stuff, like, uh, and I gave him a list of like two dozen different things. Like, can, I, can you see if somebody's injecting packets via a wireless interface? Can you tell if a lock has been picked? Can you, can you tell if somebody's hiding something in like, you know, in the, in the panels of the ceiling, is there like a NUC or a Raspberry Pi hiding somewhere? Like a whole bunch of these test cases that I, nobody had the answers to. Um, and a very polite lady named Haley wrote back and she literally said, I, I don't know if you can see the text, you might be able to see the text. Um, the, the, it literally says, um, we don't think what you want to do is possible, specifically citing looking for heat for, from computers. So I'm sorry to say, Haley, you're horrifically, horrifically wrong. Um, so that's really cool. How did you do that, right? So about a year ago or so, um, yeah, almost exactly a year ago, uh, some uh, a post showed up on Hackaday about a guy who runs the EEV blog forum, who's like a hardcore EE dude, uh, took one of these things apart, realized that it was software crippled and that it runs Windows CE, and found a way around the crippling and realized, holy shit, this thing has a 320 by 240 sensor, which means it's not really worth a grand. It's more like six or seven grand. So. It went on the forum, and uh, like here's one of the posts where they describe like here's how we get into the file system, and here's how we were able to figure out how to decripple it. Um, and it was really funny because uh, Fleur would scramble when, whenever every every time they posted a, a hack or a fix to get around the crippling, Fleur would actually go and pull units off of shelves and reflash them um, with a with a patch to re-cripple them. And it went back and forth like this, like four or five times over the course of six or seven months. Um, and here I am, like, I haven't decided I wanted to spend the money yet, and I'm looking at the forum, and I'm just doing this the whole time. This is me for, like, six months, just watching, going, <laughs> right? This is me for six months, just yet, right? So at the same time, these are a bunch of EE nerds, right? They're not security people. Their job is not to do reverse engineering. Their job is not to be IT people or security people. They stumbled across this entirely by chance. And I thought that was pretty fucking cool. So, you know, props to these guys. They're able to do a bunch of cool hacker shit, right? And at the same time, this is Fleur, right? They're doing this going, oh, fuck, we thought Zora was going to be a, a proper encryption to, like, protect our shit. I'm like, oh, god damn it, stop drinking paint. <laughs> fuck. Right? So then I ended up spending the money. I, I spent the grand. I bought it on, um, on Amazon. It came to me with the first, the first level of patching, which was basically a CRC against the serial number and then, like, Zor. So they had a shell script that you could run against the, the conf config file. And that's like, that doesn't mean like you, you, they didn't encrypt the way that you talk to the thing. Basically, when you plug it in via USB, you, you go into the menu and you set the, the USB function to a certain setting, and it enables an FTP server. And you FTP in with like username flur, password flur, or something ridiculous. And you have like a document root, like a web server document root. And it's just a bunch of text files. And their protection was one file, the config file, is 
not, it's obfuscated in some way. And all they were doing was just, every time they pulled the units off the shelves to reflash them, they just made that one text file a little harder to get into. And it's like, dude, you guys, what are you doing? I don't have the proper fail slide in here, but if anybody's seen that slide where there's like security fail and it's just this grassy like lawn with a door in the middle of the lawn with a lock on it. And it's like, <laughs> right? So basically, once I got it, it was this for you know the next three or four months. So I went back to my um, list of things that I wanted to try, and uh, I basically did the Monkey Island thing. I rubbed this thing on everything for several months. Um, I was I was certain I hadn't found anything particularly amazing or awesome or groundbreaking right away, and and it's still like I have to struggle to say that there was some huge epiphany of finding. Um, but uh, I was certain when I began that I would find something that's really amazing and related to security. So the first big finding of note is the difference between 80 by 60 and 320 by 240. Like you look at the math and it's 4x, but it's 4x on each axis, which turns out it's 16 times the resolution. So to go to, from on the left, uh, 80 by 60, which is uh, somebody else earlier asked me, have I tried messing with those um, iPhone versions, the, the version, the Fleur 1 or whatever that they have for the iPhone and a couple other um, competi com competitors have released products that attach to the bottom of phones that do Fleur stuff. They are, the resolution here on the left is 80 by 60. They can't go to 320 by 240. That was, that's the whole reason that this is interesting because this unit has, there's an E4, which is what I have. There's an E6 and an E8. The E6 and the E8 also have exactly the same hardware. Um, but the, t the higher ones just aren't crippled in software. It's cheaper for them to do manufacturing that way than to manufacture multiple sensor sizes. So the second finding of note was unlocking new, new m modes. And this one is, um, with the green, it shows condensation. And it does it by temperature. So if it sees a dramatic uh, delta in temperature between one place and another place that's very nearby, it labels it green. Well, that's pretty cool. So you unlock a bunch of new, a bunch of new modes of stuff. Um, so TLDR, the Flurry 4 is a grand, the Flurry 8 is $7,000, so, you know, do the math. Like, you can have $7,000 worth of hardware for a grand if you're willing to do the hardware unlock, right? So, on to the meat, right? Like, this is what I wanted to test. I wanted to test, like, can you tell if somebody's been picking a lock? Can you detect somebody screwing around with wireless networking? Can you detect people injecting packets into the network? Can you tell the difference um, on a computer whether somebody is playing games or cracking passwords or doing something else? Um, can you look at networking equipment and decide um, and decide whether something scary or evil is going on? So here's what I found out. Tell me which screenshot here on this frame is the computer that's running Hashcat and cracking NTLM passwords. You can't, because like there's a negligible difference. It's basically the same photo from two angles. Um, you can't tell which which is doing what. How do you know it's just not playing a game, right? How do you know I'm just not playing Battlefield Four? Like, how do you how can you tell I'm cracking passwords? You can't, which is sad because, you know, it's cool. You can tell, yeah, the, the graphics card is lit up, but that doesn't mean that somebody's doing evil, right? Um, here's a Raspberry Pi, right? That looks pretty cool. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. Here's some lock picks, like here's this, this lock that I, it's a master or something, I forget. It's got like six security pins or five security pins. It's pretty burly. But uh, you mess with that for 15 minutes and all your equipment lights up. Um, but then again, you're not going to see this in the wild necessarily. Um, here's an alpha. But at the same time, like, okay, if you want to use the alpha for anything nefarious, like I don't know if you can see it in the frame, but there's a really big Yagi antenna in the middle of this frame, and it's uh, the same temperature as the shelf that it's sitting on. So uh, this was me trying to inject packets into the network. So obviously it doesn't really work. So I'm like, God damn it. I had all these really cool fucking tests. And none of them goddamn worked. I'm like, what do I do? So I put it down for a little while. And I gave up. And I'm like, well, that's a piece of research wasted. I mean, now I have a cool toy. So I just started carrying it around and like dicking around. And then I realized that if you take it to office buildings and other places and point it at things, um, it's like a sixth sense for anybody on a red team. And if you do physical assessments where you have to break into buildings or assess the physical security of places, it's an amazing, an amazing toy. It's like, a, it's like having a sixth sense. So as it turns out, it's, it's pretty fucking glorious, right? So first things first, right? Because that's what I do is cameras. So it's pretty easy to tell if there's a security camera nearby because they're very obvious on FLIR. Um, from the, from the business end of the camera this time, you know, based on the other research that I've done. But like, here's a great view. This is from the ArcLight in La Jolla. Uh, you go to the ArcLight in La Jolla and they have these cameras all over the place. And um, 
they stick out like a sore thumb, and you can tell whether they're on or not. Another really fun thing you can do with this is you can detect whether the camera that is supposedly pointing at you is actually a real camera or not, because if it's not a real camera, it probably won't be warm. Real cameras have electronics in them, and they generate heat by nature, right? Another really fun like tangent here is uh, there's a Cisco AP right next to the camera, um, which probably means they're on the same physical network, which means, oh boy, suddenly now we have a reason to go to the movies, um, right? <laughs> The camera's on the same LAN, right? Ooh. <laughs> so uh, you go outside and you see the same thing. You have mounted cameras on the top of rooftops that are lit up, same sort of deal. Um, and they're, um, the way the, the, floor work, the floor gun works is if, if you point it at the sky, it just goes to like a negative 47. It can't read uh, because it's not getting any infrared. And the way, that it decide, the way that it does the math to compute what temperature stuff is is based on the input of infrared light. If there's clouds, you can point it, it'll see the clouds, and you can see the temperature of the clouds. But if it's clear, then you get this crazy um, backdrop, and you get a lot of um, range in the colors that it presents. So when you go outside, stuff sticks out like crazy. Uh, cars are another story. Um, they're another sort of, I expected them to work one way, and they totally worked a different way. For example, um, this car in the top left frame has been sat there for several hours, and you can tell that there's like residual heat on the ground from the engine compartment. Um, and the car, obviously on the right, was driving by as I took the picture, so you can tell it's all lit up, right? Um, this picture is particularly interesting because all of these cars, with the exception of the one in the very, very, very back, you can the um, hot uh, muffler gives it away. Uh, most of them have been there for quite some time. Fun, fun fact about heat and how it works in a parking lot. If you park your car during the day and the sun goes down and your car is no longer warm, your car will insulate the ground under it, keeping it warm. So these cars had been there since before the sun went down. Like this is one of those, you go to the movies during the day and you get out of the movie and it's dark and you point the floor gun at the cars, the, the ground under the cars is still warm because the proximity of the car to the ground is insulating the concrete, which probably gives you an, an idea of why, all, why animals keep crawling into cars and crawling under cars when obviously it's dark and it's night out, right? So there's that. Uh, here's another really fun, this is where we start getting into the hacker material, right? So this is the back of my phone. Can anybody point out anything interesting about this? So the large black rectangle is the battery of the phone. If the battery is that warm, something is going on because the phone is consuming a lot of juice. In addition to that, you might see a little object in the middle of the phone. Right? Here's a better view. You can turn the contrast up on this guy, right? So what does that look? Does anybody, re can, can anybody, does that shape, is that shape familiar to anybody? Yeah, exactly. It's a handcuff ship that I used to, handcuff shim that I used to hide in my phone. So fun times. You can look at devices and you're like, oh, I can see through plastic. That's pretty cool. So some editorial, though, because in the last month or so, a video showed up on YouTube with a guy who claimed that you can capture PIN codes off of ATMs and PIN codes off of, like, consumer devices. Bullshit. Completely fucking staged. And this is evidence. Like, this was, the, you know, an, an ATM in La Jolla and in, you know, the UTC mall um, 10 seconds after somebody used it. Like, tell me what their PIN code was. Good luck, bro. That's the point. The point is that this guy staged the photo. He, he manually like made the, the, the rubber buttons warm with his finger to take the picture to make the point. But in reality, real ATMs have metal buttons and metal cools down qu more quickly than you can get to it. And some people will say, well, but if you can point the camera at the pin pad, I'm like, if, that, if you're at that point already, you don't need a thermal camera. <laughs> you have a fucking camera. So there's some backhanding that needs to happen here, right? Um, so there was that, and that, was, that made me rage a little bit, and I was like, no, this guy's retarded. Um, so this was really, really cool. This was my first really big finding of note. At WRCCDC this year, um, I was bumming around the lobby with some of the people that are in the audience, and we were walking around just getting acquainted and trying to find food, and I started playing with the floor gun and passing it around as, like I did earlier with, with, um, with Beetle. I was like, here, point this at stuff. And somebody pointed it at the ground and went, I can see footprints. And I'm like, no shit. Like, they're pretty obvious and they stay for like 20 seconds on carpet, which I thought, oh, that's actually pretty fucking cool. So, and we did a test, like, okay, you guys walk 20 paces ahead of me and go around in a corner, you know, turn a corner, go somewhere, and I'll try and find you. And sure enough, like, you can track people through hotel lobbies with this thing, presuming that 
the floor is carpeted. Like it doesn't work on marble. I tried it at DEF CON and the big rotunda, whatever. Um, it works on carpet, but not much else. So it's really cool in that regard. Um, this is a HID, uh, an HID RFID, re RFID reader. Um, it would probably take a little bit more research to identify specifically what these things normally look like and what a fake one would look like, or if one had an extra antenna inside of it, or if, if it was in any way different. Um, I presume that the homemade RFID uh, card skimmers, I guess you can call them, um, like the Proxmark and things like that, don't have the same type of heat signature. So if you know what a regular uh, uh, HID reader looks like, you can spot a fake one pretty quickly. Um, here's another really fun one. Who thinks that there's maybe a bunch of servers in this room? Like, huh, there's a room in an office building somewhere, and it's hot inside. Hmm, good times, right? This was a really interesting one. D can anybody, like, just, sh like, can anybody tell me why they believe the bezel to this door would be that warm? But just the bezel, not the handle or the tumbler. That's right. But just on one side. Isn't that weird? So you can walk through an office building and point this at, at doors and immediately tell from a distance, oh, that door is magnetically controlled. So again, if you're pen testing, red teaming, and you're scoping out a building, you're dealing with a client, like, this is turning really interesting. Here's another really fun, like, Mission Impossible style one. Tell me where the laptop used to be, right? So, like, tell me, you can see, like, if you go back to the very beginning of a picture of my, of my MacBook, like, the vents are in the same place. You can tell based on the exhaust heat signature left on the table what kind of computer they had. I mean, obviously, the Apple charger behind it gives it away, too, but, you know, <laughs> derp, right? So uh, a lot of residual heat signature there. It's really neat. Um, this is a, a MacBook with a 3G, 4G modem plugged into it. Um, a lot of times you can't really tell. I thought this was really neat for a short period of time. And I said, well, how, do you, how can you tell it's not just a USB stick or something like that? So this is one of those times where you know, um, you're on the blue team, and your job is to go find a piece of hardware that the red team has deposited somewhere on your LAN. And uh, you know, if it gives away enough residual heat, it'll create a blob of warmth through whatever surface it's touching, or if it's near. If it's in a table or in a drawer or in one of these ceiling panels or something like that, at some point, the heat will begin to bleed through, and you'll get this weird patch of heat that you can investigate, right? Tell me where my phone is. <laughs> like, tell me where this guy keeps his phone. Um, this was the ICS village at DEF CON this year. Um, if anybody got a chance to duck their heads in there, like, this is what SCADA equipment looks like on thermal. It's quite warm. Like, I, I, these are essentially like, for people that are not familiar with what SCADA is, it's, it's effectively really big industrial Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah. Um, but with its own IP stack, which does really, really dumb things if you end map it. Um, and now for something completely different. Um, so entertaining and useful, but not necessarily security related. This is basically like, OK, well, I've exhausted all the interesting security stuff I can do so far with the, with the red team stuff until I can do a red team assessment like proper and, and take more photos, but um, blowing um, keyboard cleaner, compressed air at the back of a fan, you can tell the, <clears throat> the temperature is negative 1.7 degrees and it's 100 everywhere else. Um, this is what coffee looks like. This is how you can tell if your uh, uh, exhaust on your microwave is pulling all the, the hot air out of you know, the range area to your liking or not. And this is what sunburns look like. I was part of, this is pretty neat. Can you tell if you're sunburned? Yes, you can. These are English muffins. <laughs> like, hey, we get, we're getting into the random here, right? So can anybody tell me what they think this might be? No? That's where my cat was sitting. That's, that's cat butt thermal image, like thermal, thermal heat signature of cat butt, right? Um, and since these are fashionable, uh, quad rotors, um, they're actually really, really easy to spot. I, I, I might have another photo uh, of, of these guys. Uh, no, this was, this was Lothers, I believe. This was when we were at the park at Escondido. Um, another really fun bio... Um, it might be yours. Yeah, it might be this guy's quad. Um, another really fun fact, bi biologically speaking, like dudes' legs and ladies' legs are very different. Um, and this took me some Googling, like, why do ladies' legs, why can you see all the veins? That's really strange. Um, like, that's two different ladies' friends, of, two lady friends of mine on the left and my leg on the right. And they're vastly different. Like, that's really interesting. So there's some fun biological things that you can tell about people if they're wearing no pants. Um, and when you... <laughs> <laughs> and when we're talking about having no pants, like on the left, that's me at DEF CON having gotten out of the hot tub during Goon Swim with my kilt while the kilt was still wet. 
Uh, and on the right, that's uh, Teopa, who may be here somewhere, who, um, when she saw me with a floor gun, said, can you see through my shirt? To which I said, let's check. <laughs> um, so it's not so good to see through clothing, necessarily, um, unless the clothing is exceptionally thin, in which case you should presume that people can see through it anyway. I don't know. But uh, fun toy. Um, can anybody tell me what this, looks, what, what this looks like or what they think it might be? No? Maybe? Nothing? It's beer being brewed. That's uh, f five or six gallons of what ended up being um, a Belgian quad. But uh, it looks like the surface of the sun, and it's the, the, hot, the hot fluid rises to the top uh, and moves around. It it's really awesome looking in, in, in real life um, when it moves because it, it, it like slurms around. It's kind of cool. Um, so the original intended use for this device is, is basically for like housing inspections. So you go up into somebody's attic and you take a look at, um, is there AC working? Are there, is the, um, insulation doing what it's supposed to be doing? Are there leaks in places? Um, so that's what it's intended to do, but you know, it, it can do a lot more and it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool toy if you have, you know, a need for it on a red team or if you do more than one or two red team assessments a year, because for a grand, it sort of pays for itself after the first go. So some really awesome add-ons. Add you can get a zinc selen selenide, selenide? Um, lens for it. And essentially what, uh, what the EEV blog forum dudes uh, are using it for is they, they kind of do this. They, uh, they sort of uh, fudge together a, a holder for the lens and then they point it at IC equipment up close and they can tell what chips are doing and what is lit up and what's working and what's not working. Um, and you can do it the other way too, as I was having a discussion earlier, where uh, if you actually took the time and you bought the right lenses, you could actually make a telescoping view for it and you can make it do like 2X or 3X. Wouldn't really be much of, it wouldn't be much of a weapon site necessarily unless you took, it, took the guts out of the housing and um, uh, had it do more interesting things, like put it in a different case. But uh, it's a really neat toy. Um, if you're on a red team, um, then consider getting one of, the thing, one of these things. And uh, over uh, the Swedish chef forever flinging pancakes onto the ceiling, does anybody have any questions? No? Good times then. Oh. Yeah, what is the time resolution as far as the change? Want to find out? <laughs> On. Well, that's kind of cool. I didn't know it showed the, the charging. There it goes. Did I answer your question? There. It's low. <laughs> well, there is about like a, a one or two second delay between the device and the, and the USB <laughs> camera it's mode. Well, like here. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would imagine pretty quickly. Because this thing, this thing, um, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, it's it's measuring in tenths of degrees, and it has like a refresh rate of fractions of a second. So, um, yeah, if you want, go for it. Huh. Yeah, the fr oops, the frame rate is kind of silly, but like, the the that's one of the things that they cripple where uh, if you spend the $8,000 on the fancy one, you get better frame rate and better stuff like that. So, um, anybody else? Brian? So you, were, uh, you showed some of the slides of uh, SCADA equipment at DEF CON. Did you take uh, the opportunity to look at like, the heat signature differences between like, mid-range systems and you know, try to build a little bit more of a corpus of uh, what systems look like under infrared and then you okay so the question was have I do I have a corpus of, of photos of knowledge of uh, different systems that are different ages to define like can you fingerprint systems via thermal it's possible but it's it's gonna be a bit of an undertaking it's gonna be kind of like when DC 949 did their stilt walker thing a couple years ago at layer one where they they uh, spent like a month or whatever it was training a um, neural network on what was what was a letter and what was a number for breaking Google's CAPTCHA. It'd be basically that. You'd have to, you'd have to, like, you can go into the menu here, and you can, um, you can like. Oh shit! <laughs> Hold on. 
There. So you can go to the menu, and you can, you can um, set the temperature scale. So like, if you watch the top right there, I can manually set the temperature scale. And if I hold it, you can see how like everybody's getting hotter. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. No. But um, right, so you'd have to manually set it to a specific temperature range and then conduct essentially very, like, as clean as you could, like very sterile um, laboratory-based testing where you have, you know, a, uniformly, a uniform temperature background and you put the device down and uh, you get a look at it and you see what color it is. Um, and then the other thing you have to take into consideration is that the ambient temperature of where the thing lives and the ambient temperature of where you did the test versus um, where the device you're trying to fingerprint lives and how that plays into it. So it's possible, but it would be a lot of work and there'd be a lot of sort of squishy, fuzzy math you'd have to deal with to define like atmospheric and surrounding conditions and how that would affect whatever you're trying to measure. A lot more power. A lot more power, yeah. but with less efficiency. So if you were able to correlate like the size of the machine versus the uh, heat output, you can also get an idea of uh, is it something that is running an ancient version of an operating system? Because likely they may not have been able to patch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could, it would it would be challenging because the, the the you'd have there's a lot of a lot of additional stuff you'd have to consider. Is the power supply the same? Is the motherboard the same? Does it have the same RAM? Like, is the, are the fans working? Are the fans shitty and covered? Like, are they caked in dust? So there's a lot to consider. Um, like, you, it's basically you'd have to. You, it's almost the same as just looking at it with the naked eye and being and being able to try to to define those same those same things like you can tell if the power supply is going bad you can tell if the fans are starting to suck or if you're not if you're um <laughs> or or stopping to suck <laughs> um you can also tell if the circulation in the case that you're using is is behaving the way that you would like or not um but for uh, for all the stuff that you would expect that it, you'd be able to define it turns out that the atmosphere affects what you're measuring to a very large degree so for finite stuff, you'd have to measure it in like sterile laboratory type conditions because the way that heat affects things is pretty dramatic, um, which is why like you can point it like you can, I can point it at the AC and tell you like, OK, that AC vent doesn't really work. Where, where's the AC coming from? Well, it's coming from over there. Right. That's where all the AC is coming from in the room. So if it's sweating, if you guys are sweaty, that's why. But like, yeah, so there's one. Right? Oh, no, there's two. There's another one over there. And you can see it's not really blowing one direction. So there's some stuff like that you can tell. But that's because, you know, if you look at the temperature scale on the right, you have 82 on one side and 62 on the other. It's a 20 degree swing. And when, something, when there's something that dramatic, it's, it's pretty easy to spot. But in computers, you have, the, you know, a metal, you have a bunch of metal equipment, a bunch of cooling equipment, and a bunch of stuff touching everything else so the heat will bleed. So it, it can be done, but I, not with something this weak, and it'd probably take quite a lot of research. Yes? Presumably, um, you, to test that, what essentially you'd have to do is uh, the input you'd get is less visual and more of like, um, like if I, I can turn on the measuring like dot and I can point it at Nick's head and Nick's head is 91.6 degrees, right? Like I point it and, and it'll measure, like it, it's, it does spot measurements. So you basically you'd have to do, you'd have to do that and you'd have to get a spot measurement for what the, um, what the temperature is of the device under ideal or normal working circumstances, and then use that as a control and test other chips. But at that point, it, it becomes less of a, does it look cool on camera, and more of a specific, you know, we want to, we want to make sure that it, uh, it's this particular temperature uh, when it's doing this particular thing. Probes yeah, and there's temper yeah, exactly. There's temperature probes that cost less than this $1,000 FLIR unit. So yes, you can do it, but you could probably get away with you know spending less. Go ahead. Uh, 
Um, that's a very good question. Um, possibly, I, I would I would be willing to say that if you were willing to spend the money on on the Flur tools because they have like a software package you can buy um, that you might be able to do something like that. Or one other thing you can do is you can set it to a fixed temperature, and then you what you can do is entirely post processing based on the photo. You can you can set the the temperature range to a specific temperature, and then you can um, do basically fuzzy math on that color gauge on the right hand side, that color column, and you can extract what color, like using the, like the Photoshop eye, eyedropper tool, extract what color of pixel it is that you're interested in and compare that to the color on the chart and get a rough idea of what temperature it is. But besides doing something like that, I don't know, that's probably a better qu a question better suited for FLIR. I have no idea. No, I'm I am sadly not that leet. <laughs> Go ahead. So if I have way more money than cents, how how high a frame rate could I get out of something like this? Thirty. Like they make weapon sites that are like camcorders. Thirty frames a second, nice fast. Um, you might be able to get more uh, because I have a suspicion that that they do. I may have seen a MythBusters episode where they had one of the thirty or forty thousand dollar cameras and they were able to take it to like sixty frames a second because they I think that was the one where they were trying to cook with C four. <laughs> um, yes, you can actually cook and eat with C4. I'll spoil it. But uh, yeah, I believe they do exist. I don't know how high the frame rates will get you, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that you can get between 30 and 60 frames a second without having to bend over backwards. How, how high of a frame rate are you looking for? Um, several orders of magnitude higher. Oh, so you want like straight up slow mo? That's a very good question. Um, I encourage you to um, go. Let me see if I can go find uh, go find her email address. You can email Haley, and you can tell her, "Hey, that fucking asshole at Con called you out, so you should like send bombs to his house or something." Um, Haley Barclay, Fleur PR. She's on LinkedIn and she still works there. I checked. So yeah, Haley Barclay. Um, yeah, go find her on. Uh, yeah, you can go find her on on LinkedIn. But yeah, talk to Fleur. Um, I I asked Fleur for help, and Fleur very politely told me to go fuck myself. So, yeah, go ahead. The last time I checked, I think it was. But if you go to um, if you just Google for the EEV blog forums then uh, you'll find the thread. It's got like five or 600 uh, pages worth of posts, if not more by this point. Um, I, would, I would wager yes. All the way in the back. An E4 what? An E4 oh, bravo. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. That's I've, this is the first I've heard of it. Uh, apparently, there's a Fleur E4B that's being sold for a hundred or two hundred bucks less. So, I don't know. but eighty by sixty is garbage. Like it's practically unusable. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to look into it. Go ahead. Yeah, I did that. Do, 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 do. There. Oh, yay, I'm a <laughs> fucking retard. There, that guy. Okay. That's a 24 dBi Yagi. The antenna is like this big, and it's attached to a 2 watt alpha, and it's just cranked as high as I could get it. The alpha looked like that. The alpha was doing all the work, but this guy was like, lol, nope. So I tried. Yeah, it was, it was this, right? It was that. So that was that. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I don't have any of those pictures in my deck, but uh, it was less than interesting. <laughs> it was another one of those circumstances where because stuff is so close together, the heat bleeds across surfaces to everything, and everything is kind of this weird m porridge of a hot spot, and you can't really tell. Anybody else? No? 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 Well then. 
All the way to the end. All the way to the end. Oops. Thank you very much. Let's go drink. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.